freeze croissant after fermenting. Mark? It, it is done. Um, uh, it is done in the industry. Um, it's again, it, as, as Lynn has, Dr. Lynn has mentioned earlier, it's a different dough processing. So you, you run a, a cooler dough to begin with, with, with less fermentation and you don't fully proof. It's more like a, a three quarter proof is what we might call it. And uh, it needs to be shock frozen. Um, so the ideal situation would be like a, a nitrogen tunnel or something of that effect. Um, uh, so where it's, it's flushed with uh, uh, nitrogen gas to, to freeze it instantly. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, then they can be taken from frozen and directly put into the oven to bake. Uh, there's a number of large manufacturers that do this for the food service industry. Um, it is it is done. So it is possible, but you have to uh, change some of your processes a little bit. So Mark, I have a follow up question for you then. Why ferment rather than um, let your clients ferment on their end? Um, there's a number of reasons in, in like a restaurant type situation, they don't have the, uh, the, the proofing ability general, uh, generally available. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the thing about, uh, chefs and cooks is, um, they don't like, paying, they don't like paying attention to the details. Right? Um, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you need a place to then proof it, is it going to be consistently always warm and or is it going to be too hot or too cool um, if you don't have proof boxes and things like that? So then the consistency is not there. Um, in in-store bakeries, often the problem is often overproofing. Um, so um, that is where it is, is most popular. It is a little more expensive to purchase the items. Um, but at a food service, like at a restaurant level, the impact is minimal. Um, I have seen um, like miniature style croissants that are like a, an ounce and a half in weight, and they were only like 60 cents US a piece. Um, so really, that's that, that it, it is a little more expensive, but it's not a huge to the restaurateur. It's not a huge difference. Well, if you're if you're freezing um, the uh, the pre-proofed ones, it needs to be done under flash freezing, like uh, nitrogen, like uh, dry ice, or uh, what's also being used a lot in Europe. I've heard is uh, carbon dioxide as well is another freezing medium. Um, so that is um, you know I can't even remember the temperature now, but it's like minus. Celsius or something. Right? Um, it's extremely cold. It's very rapid. It's instant. For other general freezing, it's kind of, I would say, the colder, the better. You want to have an efficient freezer. Um, if you have a standard minus 20 Celsius type of refrigeration, that's great as long as you have good air movement in there so that it can extract the heat fairly quickly. Um, if you have a super full freezer, it's it's not going to work very well because then the air can't move if it's like a reach in or something like that. Um, there are some blast freezers that are used on the market, of course, as well that that wor works well too. So with with freezing in general, the quicker you freeze, the the better you preserve the freshness and the quality of the product. Um, the yeast and the the gluten are sensitive to freezing in that regard um, so they can become damaged if you freeze too slowly uh, because then very large ice crystals form and it separates out of the dough and, and uh, you get lots of problems afterwards That's when the margarine was too too firm or too cold, and the dough was too soft. Um, so it can be either or or both. Um, uh, it's it's most often that the margarine is too cold. Uh, that then it break as as Dr. Lin was talking in the presentation here. It starts to break into pieces. 
capacity laminate. It needs to remain very pliable and malleable um, so that it nicely stretches out. And it's also an important function that it's cool enough within the dough because that rigidity of the fat, as you sheet it out, as the, the machine sheets it, it holds the dough in place and prevents it from retracting too much. So if you have a dough that is too warm, which softens the butter or margarine, and, it, and then as the machine sheets it out, the machine's doing a perfect job because it can't adjust. Right? Um, only the human can adjust the machine. And um, then it will start to uh, pull back because it doesn't have rigidity. So that could be also a dough that is too firm too. So just while we're on that subject. Well, it really depends on how many laminating sections you add to the croissant line. So for example, with, with ours, our folding units, if we have a standard line with two folding units on it, we will typically, that will produce about uh, 144 layers within that croissant. The, the thing to keep in mind there is that you have to have enough fat in the system for your layers yes. or a little, a, a, the least amount of fat for the layers. So if you go for a croissant that has 18 layers, for example, you don't want to have 23% of the formula in fat because then that fat will just melt out and ooze out after the baking becomes a waste. At the same time, if you're going for 144 layers, you better have at least 23%, more, most likely higher around 30 to 35 to get good layering that way. So because you're, as you make more layers, you, you thin that fat out even further. Well, that would be what we just talked about the, the first question, and that would be um, producing croissants that are pre-proofed and frozen. Um, and so then they're ready to bake at that point. Parbake does not work with croissants. That is not even an option. The last well, banner. <laughs> um, that can vary. I, I, mean, I would throw that over to my, my colleague, <laughs> um, what they see on the, the equipment runs, because they're, they're going to be experts in that area. But I'm going to say you, you want to keep it really low, like one to two percent of, of your formula. Um, I mean, you can put in more if you put it back into the mixer, right? I mean, I mean, I, I think you can get away with it for five percent. But I think someone on the forums once said, well, they use 25 percent of rework and don't. I'm like, that's too high. Um, so less than 5% in the mixer, less than 1%, 2% in the sheeter itself, right? Yeah, so you rework into the sheeter. We, so I don't know. Dave, Matt? Lynn, 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 we, we typically recommend that um, all rework goes back through the mixer. We prefer that because you can see stratification, too, inside of the sheeter. Mm -hmm. If you try to put it in the sheeter and you get a, you'll get an inconsistent dough sheet at that yep. point in time. So our recommendation is always to take rework on a line like this and put it back into your mixer. Yeah, and the thing is, the, the, the other reason to keep it low is because there is, you've got so much butter in your rework. So now you're adding fat to the dough and you're going to lubricate the gluten and you're, it's, it's going to affect all of your, your dough consistencies and performance. So you, you need to keep that rework low. Has any of you experienced um, a bakery that just keeps its rework aside and bake a different batch of croissants altogether? Like, would that make sense? I haven't, but you could create some sort of a, you know, almost like a fritter or a, or right, a monkey exactly. bread or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just chop it up with instead a bunch of, the, of uh, instead of putting rework back, you know, yeah, like a like a Chelsea bread or something. You mm -hmm. chop it up with candied fruit and yeah, and brown sugar and and more fat. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think uh, bakers are not uh, privy privy to this information because we have always been taught that uh, rework is a good way to save money, 
right? Mm -hmm. And we didn't think that uh, we could use rework any other way, right? So I think um, if you're a, an industrial baker and you have traditionally put rework back into your mixer at about, I think some of some of you get away with 10% rework um, on the bread side. Mm -hmm. um, it's on not the side, same. Sure, yeah. It's not the same as the pastry side, and mm -hmm. uh, you are definitely going to see a huge impact on uh, your pastry quality if you do even above three percent rework. So don't um, don't do it. And if you do it, just think about a new product that you could put this rework in. Well, and and, and if you're going to create a product from rework, like we just kind of jested about a little bit, um, you have to be uh, aware of your potential success. So the thing is, don't price it cheap because it's rework, because if it sells like hotcakes and now you can't keep up with demand, how are you going to make it? You don't want to be making dough to make rework, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, you, you, want, you want to make sure that you, you temper your success with something like that so that it is something either um, as a special or temporary or seasonal. And um, and like, don't give it away. I mean, you know, make make your money off of it so that it is worthwhile to go through that practice. Ah, well, there's been wars over that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that hasn't been legislation in um, in France over how much fat no. you use? Uh, not yet. No, actually, okay. that's that's one of the things. No, um, they haven't. Right? There's 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 not much they haven't legislated in France and Germany on food, but uh, um, uh, it's 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 a sort of a general school of thought. And the thing is, if you it's one of those things too. If you put too much fat, it's not going to be a, a benefit. As we talked about earlier, it's going to leach out. It's going to make for a greasy product that is not enjoyable. Um, the smaller amounts tend to produce better results as a whole. So the thing is like, you know, going, not, not trying to push it too high, right? Um, there is a um, sort of a trend in the US lately of opulence of where people are taking, you know, a brioche that is already fairly high fat dough and then laminating it with 30% butter on top of it. And it's just, you know, it's just oozing fat everywhere, right? Um, and uh, and then you know add tons of sugar to it and call it a brioche couinon right and uh, or something like that. Uh, but um, twenty three percent of the uh, fat in the formula represents almost fifty percent of the flour weight or around fifty percent of the flour weight. That is roughly also a thirty percent of the dough weight uh, lamination. So anywhere from twenty five to thirty is most typical for most croissants. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is most common. Puff pastry is different. It is much higher because, of course, it has no yeast. Well, we basically have, you know, what I'll say are, are kind of four main areas that differentiate ourselves from our competition. The first one is really our sheeters. We, we have two options within our sheeters. So depending on the type of dough you're going to run, if it's a very, very soft dough, we have our soft dough technology sheeter that we can actually go up to, you know, a 90, 92% hydration um, with that. So we can go really soft on those. And our standard TBP handles more of your traditional doughs and your traditional moistures. But also then we go down to our fat pump. Um, we're, we, we feel we have the best fat pump on the market, quite honestly. It's more of a it works on the same principle as kind of a positive displacement pump. But what it does is it makes sure that you have no air in your fat. You get a consistent sheet out of it, no bubbles, no breaks in the sheet, and it goes and it lays down very smooth. Now, we, we like to start out, you know, with our blocks of fat being a little bit cooler because we know that as we work it and as we smooth that fat out going on, it warms up. So we typically start out at about five degrees C is what we prefer. Wow. And we get, we come out, you know, in that 15 degree range and it gives us a very consistent flow and a, and a very nice sheet. Then we use motorized um, conveyors to actually book that over. 
so we get a very consistent booking going in. Oh, uh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So that's, that's, that's very um, unique to us. The next phase for us is when we really get down to actually cutting our shapes, we cut and turn in one motion. So instead of, you know, a lot of our competition will cut and use a rotary cutter to cut the shape of the croissant. They'll use a second station down the line in order to turn it and get it in the position for coiling. We, um, we don't do that. Ours cuts and turns in one motion. Uh, and we can run that, you know, up to 150 strokes a minute. Nice. So depending on the size of line and the number of rows, we can get some very high efficiencies and, and, and really large quantities of croissants coming out of our systems. So we cut and turn um, all in one motion. Then we get down to um, our patented vacuum coiler. We actually use a vacuum belt underneath our product in order to hold that piece of dough into position so that we get a very consistent coil. We, get, we, we have units before that where we can slightly stretch the dough so we can control the number of, number of coils um, very consistently. We get a very consistent product coming out, um, looking almost identical every single time. And then kind of our most, uh, our other unique feature is the way we bend our croissants. If you want a bent croissant, say you want to run a, a croissant that is fully bent and pinched, uh, together, we can do that because we use robots. We actually use robots at the end of the line. We can program them to put any, any type of bend you want in it. You determine you want, you know, a, uh, 170 degree bend. We can do that. If you want a full 180 and pinched, we can do that. So we we're very flexible that way. And then depending obviously on the size of the line and, and the speeds that you're running, you may have, you know, multiple robots doing this but it gives you the ultimate flexibility in bending your croissants and forming different products. Um, the other thing I didn't mention, that's actually very nice too, with our, with our cutting and turning device, our CCT, um, you can change over size on that in less than 10 minutes by changing oh, wow. the tool you know. So you can actually go from one size croissant to another on the same line, in less than 10 minutes um, by changing out the tooling. Wow. So it's, it's, it's very efficient in that respect. That's incredible. Nice. Depends on whether it's a fresh or frozen dough. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I think you can get really nice uh, volume with a frozen dough if you use uh, ascorbic acid and possibly uh, ascorbic acid is needed in that process just so that you know um, it gives that added uh, fermentation freezing tolerance okay um, but if you're in a fresh situation you might get too big of a volume or even too much of a burst and or you get blisters Yes, and also bucky dough, which is really hard to 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 sheet out, you know. So um, if you're having problems with the volume, it has really a lot to do with your lamination for for croissants, um, not for bread, right? So uh, because of the layering, the layering needs to be done properly. That's how you're going to get volume. Okay, protein level needed for a good croissant. Mark, what do you think? I'm suggesting eight to twelve. The, the Goldilocks zone for the uh, protein level tends to be in the nine to ten and a half range um, and, and somewhat that's going to depend somewhat regionally as well because you know I'm referring to mostly North American type flowers um, in in the US we would shoot for something in the 10 to 11 in Canada probably in the nine to ten range in Europe you would need something that is a little higher just because the uh, the quality of the protein is not there. The, the strength is not there in, in many of the European flowers because it is a, a soft wheat flower, right? Um, so that's why like something like the, the 550 has an 11 to 12% protein, but it performs a lot like a 10% protein in the U.S. Yeah, it really depends on where you are and yeah. how consistent is the quality coming from a miller. Um, mm -hmm. Certain countries have and certain regions in the U.S. have better control over this. 
So if you're a small, small scale baker, you are at the mercy of your distributor. If you are a large scale producer, then it's, it's, it's something to bring to the table to talk to when, when it comes to price, pricing of the flour. Okay. Yep. So um, I would go with what Mark suggests and um, the lower, the better, if you can. Oh, I love the challenge. You know how I love challenges. <laughs> yes, yes to vegan croissants. I have seen nice technology with the rolling shortening. And uh, for sure, you know, and if you want low fat, you can always look into Alestra. But Mark, you can continue to con conversation um, there. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, you know, Alestra may not be the ideal answer, but there's there's technologies. And like you said earlier in the beginning, we don't want to get into too much of the detailed science, but there are technologies like organogels, uh, which are gels that are formed with water xanthan gum lecithin and oil and these can significantly reduce the fat especially the saturated fats and provide structure to liquid oils um, so that they are actually uh, thermoreversible in other words they melt and set up right um, so it's out there it's uh, it's still in mostly in research stages um, uh, dr alex marangioni at the university of guelph is one who works with this a lot. So if you want to hook up with him, I'm sure he would be glad to to give you something to try in the real world. Right? So, and, and Lynn, to take that a step further, we have actually been um, asked and have run and developed our lines to actually run gluten-free. Oh, for some awesome. As well. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that, that is amazing. That is- I want to see that. Yeah. There's Great video proof, guys. it's on LinkedIn. All okay, right, cool. we'll go yeah. check it out. <laughs> I, I love croissant innovation. You know, if any of you have something to bo boast about, we'd love to see it. We'd love to see it and talk about it. Um. Well, it would require a changeover um, on our cutting tool, as we said. But yeah, we we can run sizes down to you know what we call a micro mini, basically, which is a, a 50, 50 millimeter base and a sixty millimeter height on on croissants, and we get some you know amazing rates off of that. And then we go all the way up to you know our what we call our, our largest size or our maxi size, which is about, which has a hundred eighty five millimeter base. And, and really 150 millimeter height. So we, we're kind of all over the board, anywhere in between that, we can do specialized tooling to, um, to create whatever size that you wanna run. How quick is the changeover? Like how, how much would the line be down? How um, you can, you can change the cutter over in less than 10 minutes with two people. Okay, thank you. multivac packaging yeah um can you uh elaborate that a little bit more matt well you know, it's it's it can be difficult with croissants because of the delicate um nature of a croissant but uh multivac is obviously the company that uh has acquired fritch and their specialty is modified atmosphere packaging so we've done numerous uh baked goods and the modified atmosphere packages um that uh, extend shelf life. Of course, you know, you if you want to extend, you know, you can always freeze a product, but uh, if you want to keep it fresh, uh, modified atmosphere tends to be the one way you can you can do that. Dave can probably answer more than I Dave's had a lot more packaging experience. I'm more on the baking side, but uh, yeah, I mean it, basically you're taking that that package and evacuating the ambient air and and filling it with Typically, it's a combination of nitrogen and CO2. Uh, you know, the CO2 acts as an agent to keep from keep mold from from generating on any type of product. It's more of a, a mold inhibitor than anything. But uh, we 
Multivac has done packaging with gluten-free breads and gotten some, some extensive shelf life on those um, at ambient conditions. So uh, it, it's definitely doable. Um, you know, it, it takes um, some design work on the package and on the side, but it's typically a thermal form type of plastic um, um, environment that it goes through and it's very effective. Yeah, the, the nitrogen is um, commonly used in, in general to prevent uh, oxidation of the fats. So it's also going to help in terms of prevent it from going the, the butter or, or fat that's in there from going rancid. And it seems I don't know if there's any research on it, but it seems to also retard staling and, and things like that. So there's um, because if you if you use a whole lot of monodiglycerides and things in a croissant, then you lose all of the crispiness. You, you, you don't get any of that, that crispy flakiness anymore afterwards. It becomes just a, a very soft, mushy kind of product, right? So as usual, I would go into my um, lecture on two things, texture and mold, right? If you have the mold figured out with the atmospheric um, uh, um, uh, moldified, MAP, you know, then that, that would take care, that would take care of the mold issue. So the texture issue is how do you prevent it from staling? Um, and I think that uh, you can, you know, um, if you're going to go six months shelf life on this thing, then think about amylase and also know that you have to put instructions on your uh, final product that needs to be reheated, right? So a little bit of amylase and reheating, it's just gonna bring back the texture of the croissant. So those are the two things you need to look into. That's going to depend on your freezing process, but it's not it's not like you need to double it or anything. Um, also depends whether I mean, usually with with frozen croissant, you don't ferment um, in just in terms of not getting too much activity. Um, but um, so I and there are dough improvers out there, too, that you can use to help protect the yeast. And so if you talk to the, the companies that provide that, they can help guide you the best. And also look into osmo tolerant yeast. And yes. osmo tolerant is it's going to let you use less yeast, even though it's a little more expensive, um, but it does the job, right? I mean, the whole thing about using cheap yeast, and I know a lot of us do it because we buy we buy yeast for our uh, bread in the bakery and we're just, we're just going to use it in the croissant. Um, and then you figure out you're going to freeze it and that yeast will not be freezable. In fact, you will waste a lot of money if you use that kind of yeast. You have to ask your yeast producer, hey, do you have a special yeast for my frozen dough or use osmo tolerant yeast if you have access to it? I have a, uh, a piece from one of our our bakers from fridge that I can, um, the reason I'm giving you that up front is because I don't want any of you here to think that I actually know this kind of information because this is definitely from a baker. So Mark, don't laugh when you hear me saying this stuff. But uh, he claims that uh, yes, you can freeze a croissant directly after proofing. The temperature should not become too cold because this will kill the yeast cells. When too warm, the water is too warm is what he's saying. I mean, of course, this is German uh, to English here. Uh, when the water's too warm, it can, it'll build up too big of ice crystals, which are also hurting the yeast cells. It's important to reach a core uh, temp of negative eight. I'm assuming that's Celsius. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, quickly, because once that point is hit, he'll claim everything is fine. So, Mark, do you agree with all that? Yes, I agree with it, too. That makes okay. a lot of sense. depends on whether the croissant is a fresh product or a frozen product. Yeah, fresh or the fresh product and uh, osmo tolerant yeast or dried yeast with the frozen product. And, and it's ensuring that your process gives the yeast enough time to hydrate and things like that. Lamination! <laughs> 
layers and lamination exactly sorry to yeah. like make a joke out i didn't i didn't mean to make a joke out of this but um i think a lot of us go into this thinking that we if we give it like two or three folds it's gonna work i don't think it's gonna it works that way and uh, mark has a lot of um experience in this so mark how do you turn something bready into something like a honeycomb well, it's, uh, I, I would say rather than trying to turn the bready into the honeycomb is how do you get the honeycomb period? And um, the breadiness is, is most likely caused by, as you said, it's lack of lamination or the lamination is damaged. So the, the dough, the, the fat is either being worked into the dough or there's not enough fat there to produce the layers. Um, it can sometimes be other pro problems in the process and the, if the proofing could be too hot and things like that. But it's, it's key, as we talked about in the beginning, that the, the, the fat to dough ratio is in the, that 25 to 30 percent range and that the temperatures are maintained and that the time to relax the dough in between is there too, that the dough be extensible. So when you're running on a line such as which, what Fritsch has, they have ways that in, in the booking and folding that it actually helps the dough contract a little bit so that it's not overextended, right? Um, whereas when you're doing it by hand, you, you're extending the dough and, and folding it and now you need to let it rest. You, ideally, you let it rest under refrigeration the golden rule of thumb is 20 minutes. I, I often go 30 or 40, right? It depends on your schedule too. Um, and so, and not trying to make too many layers. If you try to make too many layers with 25% fat, the fat becomes so thin that it cannot uh, prevent the steam from uh, escaping uh, into the next layer. So the lamination process is essentially a, a physical process where the steam escapes from the dough and then the layer of fat prevents the steam from going into the next layer or anywhere else so it traps it and that's your honeycomb your honeycomb is steam trapped between fat and dough so that is how you create that if that makes sense i think you can also overwork a croissant yes. i mean we have to be very careful when dave mentioned how we can stretch a croissant to get the desired number of coils, you have to be very careful how far you stretch that because you'll damage the, the laminations and so therefore yes. you'll get a, a breadier product. Yes, yeah, a lot of people have this, um, there's this thing that has emerged that a, a true French croissant must have four shoulders on each side, right? Yeah. Um, but if the, if, you, if the croissant isn't cut in a long enough shape, um, and right. or you know not stretched enough, you won't get those four shoulders. You stretch it too much, you're you're stretching the fat away from the dough. So there again, you're you're making bread with with some fat incorporated, right? yeah. um, and it doesn't it doesn't become that flaky layer. Yeah, you delaminate those layers is what happens, and it fractures. Yeah. That's a magic question, Dave. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. So, you know, we, we use, you know, our, our first reduction is actually our largest reduction. And we use a satellite head, which is a series of rollers that actually um, take the product down in thickness fairly rapidly. Uh, you know, and, and you may do a, a, you know, almost a 60% reduction at that point in time. And then depending on where you're going to go with that, you may have one or two additional calibration rollers um, prior to, to the actual cutting. Uh, when you're doing the lamination, you typically will go through a satellite roller and a single reduction roller to get you where you want to go. Then go through your second um, uh, folding unit to get that next set of laminations. So it, a lot of it just depends on the type of dough you're running, the moisture in the dough. Uh, so there's, it, it, in some cases, I'll say it's kind of a trial and error, you know, mm -hmm. what, what works best for the type of dough and the type of fat that you're using, um, will depend on what that is. I, this, as Mark said, there, there's no magic number to that, but we typically would never go beyond on the first step, never go beyond a, you know, 40 to 60% reduction, uh, depending on it. So, 
Yeah, even on, like on, on reversible dough sheeters where you're, you're manually running the sheeter, I've usually not gone much more than 40 on the, the first step. So like from a 30 millimeter, because when you're rolling by hand or manually, your doughs tend to be a little bit thicker anyway, right? Um, but go like say from a 30 to 18, from 18, then you can reduce down to like maybe 15. And then you, as you go down, the, the ratio indirectly increases, but it's the steps are smaller, right? Yes, um, exactly. And, uh, and you want to make sure you don't go too thin. Um, typically, a croissant is usually in the five to three millimeter thickness. Um, you go any thinner than that, you're crushing the layers. And there again, you've, re you've eliminated all of the lamination. Yeah, and with that, I just want to say one quick thing before I forget. We've talked a lot about our, our industrial line, mm -hmm. but you know, as Fritch, we make a lot of, of artisan type lines as well with reversible sheeters, uh, artisan cutting tables, makeup tables for small to intermediate size. And we have a, an intermediate size um, line that can run croissants as well and automatically coil them that, you know, for the, the smaller intermediate type of bakers. So I won't go into to those very much, but you can go to our website. It's it's fritch-group.com and all of those items are there for people to mm -hmm. look at as well. Yeah, you have you have great machines as well. Yeah, they're amazing. I've I've had the good fortune to work with them many times. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. you know, I, I think if you're looking at a croissant sheet, um, you know, as Mark said, they typically run anywhere from three to five millimeters. Uh, but I mean, you can run whatever thickness you want, um, you know, with, with, you know, if you want to run a half inch thick sheet, you can do that. But yeah, you go with a 10 millimeter or like a 12 millimeter sheet, you're going to have a very large croissant. <laughs> it's yeah, gonna I, be, I also think you know, people like are thinking about, you know, ways of innovation, right? Maybe they want to make a croissant bun or, you know, a croissant sandwich is something like that. So now, if, well, if yeah, you're you, talking about, you know, the length, you know, what size belts we run, for example, you know, our, our large croissant lines run on a 1.3 meter belt. So you know, while it's from a thickness standpoint, but from a from an overall size standpoint, our large industrial lines are typically 1.3 meters wide. And but Dave, on, is on, always, so, so. on on average, Dave, uh, typically, because you have the the fat pumps that that extrude the fat onto the dough. So at, at that stage, did you have a second layer of dough going on top, or do 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 yours? Oh yeah, you would have a second layer going on top, right? Yeah, but we fold we fold it and book it. Okay. So we actually put the fat in the center and then we book it from each side. Oh wow. Okay. And typically we use, we what... use powered powered conveyors to do that. Well, it is it is not a dream, but it is extremely challenging. Um, I have had the um, good fortune, I would say, to have uh, actually worked in <clears throat> with customers in the Caribbean and Puerto Rico and Jamaica. And uh, Richard Charpentier and I were just sort of sharing. He he lived in the Bahamas for a time as well. It is quite challenging. Um, the most important thing is to keep everything cool and so this starts with making the dough and um as the the room temperatures can be quite hot like when when i was working in the bakery in jamaica it was 110 degrees in the bakery in fahrenheit um and uh so that's almost 40 celsius and that that is pretty extreme and so you know you can use cold water and ice to a certain extent but it that's not the only thing what you need to do is you need to refrigerate the flour uh, a couple of days beforehand. So if you have 50 ba pound bags of flour, you need to put those uh, several bags of flour in the refrigerator several days ahead of time because it will take many days to extract all the heat out of that. Then so you start off with cold flour, cold water, 
and get a cold dough and just keep that dough cold as much as possible right um to and then you can do it right um it's just about keeping everything cool so you would uh, roll the dough you know you portion it out ferment it roll the dough and uh, book fold it as we were talking about on with the uh, fritch uh, last week thursday and um so it means you envelop the butter and then back in the fridge for a few minutes and then roll it out for your first fold and back in the fridge to rest for 20 minutes and just always keep it refrigerated with all your rests and when you're ready to do production if you're a smaller facility don't try to roll out the whole dough all at once do half or one third at a time so you can keep everything cool mm -hmm. of course if you can get refrigerated granite or marble countertops that would be wonderful but that is probably more of a pipe dream in in the caribbean because it, the electricity is also extremely expensive to keep something like that cool right absolutely so and if you can uh, produce these products at night or early in the morning the yeah. better it is before it gets too hot in the bakery mm -hmm. and understand that a lot of bakeries in the tropical areas do not have air conditioning so mm -hmm. that you know you those are excellent excellent tips to start with um yes air you conditioning can produce... is open the door and get a breeze off the ocean <laughs> <laughs> yes you can do it but follow um what mark suggested in terms of the cooler ingredients all right mm -hmm. and and there are um you can find ice charts i think we might have one on bakerpedia as well um where it, it tells you to your target dough temperature if you're trying to reach a a dough temperature of 68 degrees and your your flour is 80 degrees and your room is 100 degrees it tells you how much ice you have to put in together with the water to achieve that um optimum dough temperature the one saving grace with something like croissant, because of the lamination process, can act as a form of gluten development to some extent. You don't have to worry about mixing problems with all the ice as you would with bread, um, because the the water, the frozen water, of course, that is ice, doesn't get absorbed until it starts melting. It is possible. It is very challenging, but it is possible. Um, I have seen a a baker on LinkedIn in Australia who has claimed to have done this. And the the uh, key is in developing an extensible gluten free <laughs> dough. So using different proteins such as um, certain isolated or treated uh, whey proteins um, and and those those types and uh, you know things like xanthan gums and so on so that you have a dough that will stretch and extend and be able to hold on to those uh, and, and extend with the the butter because if the dough is too soft then the, the dough spreads and the butter doesn't if the dough is too stiff the butter spreads and the dough doesn't so you won't get the lamination it's getting that right texture. It's just like with a regular dough, only though that you, it's a little trickier to get that texture, right? Um, uh, and yes, it is possible. And, uh, you know, if you're unfamiliar with gluten-free in, in bread baking or things like that, then work with uh, some of the suppliers. They have a lot of great solutions. And the nice thing I like about gluten-free is you don't need to give it a long ferment. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, because you don't need you don't to need the relaxation. Any, yeah, you don't need to develop the enzymes and that you don't right. need the relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would say first of all, the first thing would be kind of enzymes that you can easily add to uh, a dough like this would be something like amylase, which is going to help with uh, fermentation. Um, because fermentation is your friend in this to keep it consistent. So if your inconsistency is falling number in that if you're getting a flour that has uh, low enzyme activity, 
and then you can boost it with amylase or you use a malted barley flour. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in terms of it keeping it consistent, so it's understanding what are you adjusting? Like what are the inconsistencies of your income ingredients um, to, to adjust so that uh, if you cannot get the flour consistent from your, your miller, then you got to kind of work with your miller then on the C of A's and stuff of, so that you know what to adjust. Otherwise you're, you're playing a guessing game. It is challenging. Like, you know, thinking back to our Caribbean question, when you are an Island nation, um, you know, I am again, familiar from my work with being in the Caribbean and especially in places like Jamaica and Puerto Rico, they are basically stuck with whatever's on the boat. Um, so their ability to blend grists from large storage facilities is not as good as what you would have on the mainland, right? So where on the mainland, a flour miller will be in connection with a big terminal and they can bring in a lot of different wheat to blend their grist, but whatever's on the boat is all they've got to blend with. And so... They, uh -huh. they can't all of a sudden order in another rail car of this or a rail car of that. Um, they they take that whole boat load in and, and uh, they may be stuck with the same type of flour or similar as far as their blending ability for maybe a month or two, right? Depending on how often the miller is able to get a boat in. Um, hey, Mark, here lies an opportunity, right? What's stopping mm -hmm. us from opening a mill in the Caribbean, right? <laughs> oh, there are mills in there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's we, we gotta we gotta build small boats to get more grain there. The cost. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a great question. So the, the temperature, uh, first of all, would be using the standard uh, methods that a baker uses, where you take um, your room, you have a desired dough temperature, uh, what we call So, so let's, uh, let's iterate again um, how important this is. Your butter the temperature must be between 15 to 20, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Correct. So our suggested dough temperature is... 15 uh, to 20 somewhere between there too yeah okay so, and you, you know, so how would you suggest to, to make them as close as possible oh to make those as close as possible mm -hmm. well you mm -hmm. you want to first of all keep the dough cool in the whole mixing process so as we talked about with for our caribbean friends if the uh, if the ambient temperature is much too hot where you're storing your flour or if your flour comes in from an outdoor silo, you have to find a way to refrigerate it. You have to you have to chill it uh, in advance. Um, so you need to start with a cool dough and, and getting a cool dough, you you calculate basically the dough temperature, the air temperature, the wa the, the friction temperature, and um, you take the the wa the desired the target temperature multiplied by three minus those things, and that gives you your water temperature. Um, and uh, the key to that is also then texture. So making sure that you hydrate the dough sufficiently, that it is not too stiff and don't overhydrate, don't put too much water on it so it's not too soft. So usually this is something once you have a standard flour and a method, it's one amount of water that you always use. If your flour varies, then you'll have to find methods to check that during the mixing process. So once everything is before the dough is fully developed, once it's sort of all wet, that you can check it either by hand or, or if you have another methodology to make sure it will not be too soft or too stiff. Uh, because once the dough is completely mixed, you can't adjust it anymore. Right. So I would always suggest that you try to go to a lower temperature so try to target mm -hmm. a lower temperature because you can always bring it up it's easier to bring it up yep then mm -hmm. exactly yep. the whole mixed dough into the reefer right mm -hmm. so try to target as low as you can um if you come out um cooler than expected it's easy to change that just wait a few more minutes before it hits the temperature of the butter yep. so mm -hmm. i would always like 
figure those two things out. What's the temperature of the butter? And always keep, it, it's preferable if you keep the temperature of the butter or you store the butter in a temperature controlled place, if, yes. if possible at all. Okay. Yep. And then just take it out as you need to use it. Don't let it sit in the mixing room at all. No. Okay. Yeah. It's, so it's usually tempered. And like as, as uh, David from, from Fritch talked about in with their, their fat pump that they use on their lines. I love that, that fat pump. Yeah. So if, it, if you, <laughs> if you're taking butter out of a five degree cooler, they know that the friction from the fat pump delivers them a 15 degree butter on the line. Right. So, right. Because so they have that, that increase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pretty good butter don't you think that's pretty good yeah i mean yes. most commercial butter is about uh, 83 to 85 percent mm -hmm. fat uh, some of them in europe might be one or two percent higher so we don't um, think it's the butter's problem here what do you think is the no, problem they don't i think get it's the number of it's the number of layers um the the amount of fat in ratio to the dough and the number of layers a um a traditional handmade artisan style croissant is 27 layers um some of the commercial croissants go all the way down to uh 18 layers um just because to save time on the production line on processing and stuff so they're they're not quite as flaky um but to get some of the really flaky ones that we start to see out and about they add in another fold here and there they might add in a double fold in between and so they end up with around 50 to 72 layers in that range, right? So the more layers you have, you'll get more of a puff. So if you think of a classic puff pastry, that has 144 layers. Of course, you need to use far more fat. You would have to use about 40 to 50% of the dough weight in fat to achieve that 144 layers. Mm -hmm. um, but it is doable, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. That is if, a if before today I would just have used a rolling pin and just hit at it. Yes, but you just bash today it with we a have signs. Pin. <laughs> um, Mark, <laughs> what do you yeah, suggest? Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, there's there's all kinds of great videos on on YouTube where you can see people bashing the uh, um, the butter with the rolling pin. Um, if you're if you're doing it at home, the the great thing to use is like a um, a Ziploc bag where you can keep it into a nice uh, shape. But uh, no, it, it it some of it is still experience at this point, um, unless you get into texture analyzers um, because and it a is texture not a, analyzer. Yep. Yeah, it is. It is not something that you will get on the uh, information from the fat producer. Um, it is, of course, um, dictated by the ingredients in terms of the, the amount of saturated or fully hydrogenated fats that are, are used uh, and uh, the way that it is processed, how it is votated, how it is crystallized. Um, but there is a method on a texture analyzer called a work softening method. Um, and it's a basically a cylinder where the fat goes into the cylinder with a plunger on it and it moves up and down uh, a, a set number of times and with a certain amount of pressure and things. And the the instrument measures how much this plasticity changes over yeah, time. Yeah, the modulus in there would tell so, you. Uh, exactly. Right. Um, right. Yes, there's other instruments like a rheometer where you mm -hmm. can check the the, uh, the modulus, the storage, and the, um, the energy storage and the energy release modulus. Um, hmm. That gets even more sophisticated. I actually have actually, a, a. You know, I've seen a viscometer that tests peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think exactly. that would work as well. Yep, very similar. Cone and plate yeah. type of uh, process where it, it rotates and it measures the resistance and it measures how much of the energy gets stored and how much is released. Because quite interestingly enough, the, the plastic shortenings and butters 
actually store some of the energy it's it's mm -hmm. quite interesting mm -hmm. um, that yeah you should be able to get a consistent reading um with the different batches of uh butter that you get in that could be mm -hmm. one of your control points as well if you use a texture yes yep mm -hmm. good question good question Well, there's no no additives. It's try to <laughs> try to blend the weak flour with the strong flour to get as consistent a result as you can. Um, and uh, I, I spoke with a uh, a member in Algeria we were talking about who is only gets the one kind of high protein hard flour, but they do have access to soft flour to pastry flour. And if you can do that to blend it in to weaken it, that's the main thing. And don't forget sometimes higher protein doesn't mean good quality protein higher protein no. could mean that you're getting a flour that has a lot of ash right yeah. so watch that ash as well i mean if you get like a 12 13 percent protein and uh and your ash is like really high a lot of that protein has it's coming from the ash so uh my suggestion is to understand that and if that's the case you use it at 100 you know and, well, and, and if, that's not much you can do with taking out ash you know yeah if if there is uh information on there with the uh farino graph numbers or things like that that can help tell you the story as to the quality of the protein the the important thing that we need for for vinoiserie which is croissants and danish and things like that is the extensibility um so that it's it's not just protein alone but protein is what we use as a initial guide correct i think really be concerned only if the extra amount of protein affects the buckiness of your dough and mm -hmm. then if it does that then follow what mark just recommended as in dilute it with softer mm -hmm. flour yeah all right and that's cost savings right who doesn't want mm -hmm. cost savings <laughs> The main thing is keep everything even cooler and uh, short fermentation or no fermentation at all. Yep. Um, usually for frozen dough, it's uh, really cool dough, no no pre ferment, no bulk fermentation, right away into lamination and and processing as as quickly as the dough will tolerate. Um, Well, in um, in Fahrenheit, as as an example, if you're using a deck oven, you would most likely bake at 400 uh, Fahrenheit. So higher temperatures. A higher temperature, because with convection, the additional friction from the fan and the way it carries moisture away quicker, you you generally bake at about 25 degrees lower. And croissants are usually at 375 in a convection oven. Okay. Um, they will also take slightly longer so if you usually bake 12 minutes in convection they will probably be anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes in the deck oven um, that also again depends on how well the deck uh, moves the steam away so you want to in the beginning you want to keep the um, the vents closed to keep the steam in so that the the croissant can puff nicely and then you open the vent to let it out and as quick as that, that steam vents is what helps it finish drying out. But usually about three to five minutes longer than in a convection oven. Of course, it always depends on size and how many pans you load at the same time and things like that. All of them. <laughs> I agree. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, right? they, not everybody likes them. The, the combination of the, the sourdough in a pastry, it's sort of an unexpected experience for some people. It, it works with some savory things. Um, 
it uh, it it can be done. It's just I have found that it's people don't always like it is kind of the easy way to put it. Right. Yes, it can. Um, uh, the The important thing is, again, during the initial lamination there to keep everything nice and cool, because remember, in the refrigerator, the fermentation doesn't stop. It just goes very slow. And when you take it out to continue laminating the next day, um, what you will have to do is carefully use a um, like something very sharp, like a small knife or pin to get some of that gas out so that otherwise you will crush the layers right? because you'll see the dough will rise up from proofing and so you'll have gas build up everywhere in between so you you don't want to completely break the layers but you want to pierce it to carefully get that gas out before you start rolling because if you just take it the way it is and hammer down on it and you know let the dough fart so to speak um you know it might seem funny and everything but then it's not going to look very funny when you don't have nice looking croissants afterwards there's a number of possibilities um Dough oxidation, like too much oxidation could be one of them if there's too much ascorbic acid in it mm -hmm. or if you've, if you've uh, over fermented your pre ferment or something like that. Uh, and the other thing is improper lamination. Um, if it's not laminated properly and that you just basically have a big hole puffed there, right? Um, when you're laminating manually, you have to make sure you're careful about eliminating bubbles um, because when you do it by hand it's very easy to get bubbles in even though you don't intend to um, and you have to watch for that because those yeah. those air bubbles they push the fat aside and they create these blisters like a flying crust right uh, one more thing i like to add is um, try to take your ascorbic acid down or any kind of oxidation system yeah. you have in there because the more oxidizing agents you use the more bursts you get in the oven and the, the weaker the top layer is. Okay, mm -hmm. so you could look into that as well. That's all folks, thank you for coming on today. Um, we have all the links that you need to continue this conversation. It's on the chat box. And um, tell, tell your co-workers if they miss this today, we will be launching it on our Academy next week. Thank you, Dave, Matt, and Mark for coming on. Thank you, Joanna. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Everyone. Thank no. you. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Appreciate it all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.